Susan Kambik Tracy means a lot to me, more than I think she even realizes. Uh, she has an impressive list of credits over the years. She is a dancer, arts administrator, writer, filmmaker, yoga teacher, and is recognized uh, nationally as a dance educator. She was the director of curriculum and teaching artist development for the Music Center for 25 years. And because no one there is willing to let her go, she, uh, because of her expertise and her passion for the, for the, the area of doing this, uh, after retiring, she continues as director of special projects there. If you haven't already, uh, please read her bio in the program. It will bring you to a state of awe like the rest of us. But one of the really special aspects of Susan's career is that she has mentored so many in the arts education arena. It brings tears to my eyes. I can attest to that as I have been one of the receivers of her wisdom, passion, and generosity. Much of our teaching artist program curriculum at the Actors Fund has been enriched through Susan's guidance. So without any further ado, please help me welcome our keynote speaker for today, Susan Candy Tracy. Good morning. I am so happy to be here. I am excited to share with you some of what has happened to create artists in schools. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a journey into the beginnings. I'm going to show you what's going on right now, and I'm going to show you what your future could look like if you decide to join into this. But first, I would also like to thank Joanne very much for her friendship, her collegiality, and I'd also like to, I don't know where he is, I can't see that well from here, but I would like to thank Mark Slafkin, who was my former boss, oh, we're right there, my former boss, and also an inspiration and a mentor to me as well. So thank you, Mark, it's a joy to be here at the Wallace. I would like to start with a quote from Sir Francis Bacon. This was a visionary, a philosopher, a great writer who lived in the late 1500s, early 1600s. And some people think, suspect, that he might have written the Shakespearean plays. We'll leave that up to you. And he said, begin doing what you want to do now. We are not living in eternity. You only have this moment sparkling like a star in your hand and melting like a snowflake. Pretty profound. Well, Sir Francis Bacon was a Renaissance man. And thinkers in the Renaissance believed that God had gifted humans with great potential and that people had a serious obligation to cultivate that potential and use it wisely. Having been at the beginning of the Artists of Schools program around 60 years ago, I realized at that time that we were in a renaissance and it required people who thought with innovation and inspiration and were able to tackle some very difficult social problems that were going on in our United States at that time. This was the time of the 60s, need I say more. And I joined in for the artists in schools part toward the end of the 60s, just as the back of segregation was being broken. And we were trying to find value in diversity and inclusion and equity for all. So the arts have played a tremendous role. And I would like to say, just a short footnote, that it was really President Kennedy, to a great extent, in his forming of the National Endowment for the Arts and then the Arts Councils for every state that really brought us to the place where we could begin the journey. I started teaching dance in 1962 at John Marshall High School in the LAUSD and it was the high school I had attended. 
that was 57 years ago. And I continue to train and coach teaching artists in all forms at the Music Center. I was very fortunate to receive excellent training and to find mentors that were exceptional, mentors who were passionate and fearless. They touched the love for dance within me, but they also saw in me a very strong desire to make a difference in the lives of young people. When I danced, I felt that I was expressing my true self. And I also loved choreographing my own ideas into motion. I did have a strong desire to share with others what I had learned and experienced. So as a high school dance teacher, I had five classes a day of 60 students and an after school dance club of 40. So every day, I impacted the lives of 280 students. That was a big responsibility. I took it quite seriously. A few years, three years later, I had my first child, and I took a leave of absence from LAUSD. I was hired to teach at an all arts preschool and dance studio. And this allowed me to expand my ability. I really knew nothing about young children until I had one. And then I grew along with my child in understanding how to guide them. Soon after I had my second child, I was nominated by my mentor, Bella Lewitsky, to work in a national program called Artists in Schools Dance Component. It was sponsored by the National Endowment for the Arts. So I want you to see that this was a national picture, a national support foundation that was being built. Because when we got the National Endowment and then we got our arts councils in every state, we had a network that was built and standards that could be made. Well, I was one of 25 dance movement specialists who was selected to work in the program. We had 10 national dance companies, and we were sent out to states and territories to live in that community. And there were three prongs to our program. It was six weeks in length for a year. Two weeks as a dance movement specialist, two weeks for a dance company to come, do workshops, performances, work with the students, train the teachers, and then a follow-up of two weeks with a dance movement specialist. And I played either the first dance movement specialist or the third, and in many cases, the first and the third. So I sandwiched in the dance company. It was unbelievable, actually. It was like living in Camelot. That's all I can say. Even at the time, I found it very difficult to believe that dance, including the other arts, and that also included media and film and poetry that were being promoted, they were given large grants to go and try and make a difference in communities because people who were our Renaissance leaders knew that the arts would make a difference in the lives of people and be able to accomplish social and political goals that we couldn't do with laws. All right, so it was challenging. I'm going to tell you it was challenging. The first residency I did was in Reno, Nevada. And they just sent me out to Reno, Nevada. And they said, OK, be an artist in schools. I had very few guidelines. The main thing I had was the belief in, uh, of Bella Lewitsky in me saying, Susan, I think you can do this. So I just rose to the occasion. But I made a lot of mistakes along the way. So we found some very strong resistance in certain communities. I, for example, have been in Warrensburg, Missouri, where there were four church groups that came and picketed the dance program. And they came and they sent representatives from their leadership to talk with us and to explain to us that dance was actually the religion of the devil. And that also, the biggest thing, you won't believe this, but it's true, that they found offensive was that we were teaching their children to think. 
and they didn't like that. And they told me directly, we tell our children what to think, and we do not want your interference. So we had some very tough things that we had to face. But in other parts of the country, we found amazing cooperation. It was like throwing, it's like being Johnny Appleseed and just scattering seeds everywhere you go and then seeing whole forests of apple seed trees uh, growing up and the people themselves taking over the programs and the local artists then uh, proceeding. Uh, eventually, and this program uh, went on for about 10 years of funding. That's a long time for federal programs. Uh, we included every state, Alaska, Puerto Rico, Hawaii. I myself was very fortunate to do um, residencies in all of those places. Puerto Rico was very challenging, but it was extremely exciting to see the diversity and the way that the arts were one of the, the things that unified people. All right, so I want you to replace your art form with dance as I tell you the three big purposes, goals that we had. So just substitute your own art form. So we were promoting dance in three ways. Dance as an art form, dance as a means of self-expression, and dance as an additional tool for learning in the classroom. As it turned out, I had a talent for the third goal. I thought conceptually. Everyone did not. Some people only knew dance moves, only knew how to use their art form in traditional ways that you find in studios. And they were wonderful, and they were talented, but they didn't know necessarily how to make connections to the school curriculum. And for some reason, it just came to me easily. First of all, I knew the elements of my art form well. Time, space, energy, and all the components that go with those, and matter. And those are the elements of the, of the physical universe. So there wasn't anything I could not find a connection to. And that's one of the reasons I became a leader in that respect. Along with this same period of time, I was also part of another large national initiative that began in 1969. It was called Arts Impact. Now remember, the 60s, what was happening, the turmoil, the protests, the marches, the throwing the bras out the car doors as you were flying by your work, and um, everything that was happening was being challenged. All the social mores that I grew up with in the 50s was no longer anything that guided us. Everything was thrown to the winds and up for grabs, Vietnam War, everything going on. So they thought that putting all of the arts in all of the schools in five sites in the United States might be a kind of bed of possibilities, again, like planting the seeds, making change in small ways, but that are profound and deep. So I'd like to tell you, I was with the site that was in Glendale, Cal uh, California. And at that site, we were trying to change uh, and integrate because they were a white bedroom community with a whole kind of um, wave of Hispanic people coming up through the south of that, their city and Armenian people coming in through the east. And they did not know how to deal with this. In fact, in Glendale, earlier on in the 60s, you could not walk after sunset or dusk if you had a dark colored skin. That was not that long ago. So one of these sites for the impact, Troy, Alabama, it was totally put all the money, and this was a million dollar grant, by the way, was put into the schools that they thought had a chance of integrating with some success. They felt that if the kids could learn to respect and celebrate diversity and celebrate differences 
rather than being fearful of them. Working together on projects, dancing together, um, creating together, those were the things that they felt were strong enough to sustain these difficult times. I myself had several residencies. I, re I did national endowment residencies uh, for about 12 years where I traveled a lot. Um, these residencies that I had were in Missouri, right on the Bible Belt and the Farm Belt in Missouri. I went to Louisiana, specifically to New Orleans Parish, for 22 different years. Long after the program ended, they kept bringing me back. Tennessee. So those were, and North Carolina. So those were some of the places that I encountered uh, the difficulties that people were using all their power and imagination to uh, move to a, a place of more inclusion. During this time, I was constantly given challenges by teachers. Uh, I was asked to teach things that I didn't really know anything about, or I hadn't done well, or didn't remember them from my early times of school. So I was starting to have to do lessons through dance on bacteria, <laughs> cell division, the water cycle, metamorphosis, the weather, immigration, and even, and this is true, the prime time for picking the alfalfa plant. <laughs> when I was in Missouri, I was on the farm belt, and they had an agricultural science strand in their high school. And these were all the kids that were going to be farmers. They all came in in their cowboy hats and their boots to the gymnasium. And I said, please take off your boots and your hats and come and find your own space. <laughs> and then I started. And um, I mean, I taught what's in your fertilizer bag. I taught. <laughs> I taught a lot of things that I had to study. I had books that I took home with me every night to my, to my room and had to figure out how can I teach this concept through dance. Well, that's another story. I'll tell you that later. There were lots of challenges. And as I said, there were people who did not see the value of the arts. And by this time, I'm like an evangelist with the arts. I couldn't imagine that we couldn't change everybody's mind. But there were teachers and people in the community who were resistant, reluctant. And there were places where discipline was either too tightly controlled or completely out of control. When I went to Puerto Rico, they made me work with 150 people in an airplane hangar. And what they did was they collected uh, talented students throughout the whole island, brought them to Ramey Air Force Base for three days. And they said, would you like to teach all 150 at one time, or would you like 50? And I said, 50. And they kept asking me the question until I said, I think I'd like to work with all 150. <laughs> And that's what they were, that was it. And the way they controlled, they would go, uno, dos. The kids would go, uno, dos. And they were ready. <coughs> Excuse me. So I had quite an experience working with all those high school <coughs> students. They were wonderful, though. <coughs> so, we were among the initial pioneers. To be a pioneer, and by the way, even though Artisan Schools now has been more developed <clears throat> and around, you are still a pioneer. So you've got to have that kind of pioneer spirit. You've got to have the courage that goes with being a pioneer. And you've got to have resilience. Uh, you've got to also, at this time, know how to make connections to the curriculum and to set some standards for yourself as well. <coughs> Excuse me. I would like, before I go into some details for you, to tell you about a man that made a great impression on me. He was a leading light in the 60s and 70s and even, I believe, 80s. He was a national leader. He was a music teacher with a tremendous vision, 
I was very privileged to hear him speak because they brought us back to Washington, D.C. a lot to give us leaders to impact our own uh, leadership. This man's name was Charles Fowler. And his legacy of deep reflection and initiative helped sustain arts learning experience experiences for hundreds of thousands of students. He was important enough to be buried in the National Cemetery. And the reason I know this is because everyone walks their dogs through the National Cemetery. That's the big dog walking area. And I was there with my daughter walking her dog, and we paused for a moment, and I looked down, and there was the grave of Charles Fowler. And I was thrilled that someone who had taken such leadership in the area of education, and specifically the role of the arts, had that honor. He said, I was not satisfied as a teacher with merely passing on the culture. I wanted a role in creating it. The classroom is not just a place for learning about yesterday, but a laboratory for inventing tomorrow. His work argues that far from a luxury, the arts are a vitally important part of our society and our schools. He gives examples of the crucial effect of the arts on learning, showing how the arts can enliven and extend the entire school curriculum by integrating different subjects in innovative, interdisciplinary ways. He points out, for instance, that the arts provide multiple ways to experience the world around us, and that they help to express our own relationship to this world. The arts educate the imagination and develop originality. They teach students to discern, to express, to communicate, to analyze, and to understand. They can be used as vehicles for enlivening and extending learning in general, and they are one of the fundamental repositories of human wisdom. This is the impact you can have as an artist in schools, or even after school programs, but there is a difference. Artists in schools, you have to realize you're in a school, there are rules, there's a curriculum that has to be taught, there are standards to that curriculum, and you have a partner in the classroom teacher. And you may go into a school, as I have in many classes, and see a teacher who has a completely different style than you have. And yet, that is the style that she has, and you must honor it and not judge that person. You go in and you try again to plant those seeds, show new ways of dealing with discipline, and of honoring each person and their value. But you cannot uh, go into a school as a guest and tell them where they're wrong. So that's really important. But you can also show them the diverse number of jobs. Probably everyone in this room has a different type of job because the arts are a place where there's work for creative people, for people who have that expressive, and also if you're a stage crew, for example, putting things together, managing, and making things go well. The arts emphasize deep student engagement. Better than anything and any other way that we teach, sports may be a nice second to that, but we engage in a different way. When I started teaching as being a teaching artist, now remember I said I was a teacher in a high school in 1962. Well, I became a teaching artist in 19, about 1970. And there were no guidelines, as I mentioned, but now we have the visual and performing arts. We have the common core standards, which are what should be taught in English history, math, science. And a few years ago, and Mark was very much involved in the leadership of sharing this with others, there was a study done on qualities of qualities headed by a man named Steve Seidel. These are the most important things that they found that you need to do to 
really make learning something that lasts a lifetime. Engagement, purposeful experiences creating or engaging with works of art, emotional openness and honesty, experimentation, exploration and inquiry, and finally ownership. So these are the things that should be at the center of what you do. But I'm not speaking to you today as a teaching artist. You may think I am, but I'm not. I am speaking to you rather as an animated lighthouse. I have grown into a lighthouse by navigating myself through decades of challenges, working as a teaching artist, arts educator, all the things that you've already heard, and but also a legislative advocate for equity, access, and the arts for all students. As a lighthouse, I can't move. I'm built on a craggy pile of sharp rocks looking out on a tumultuous sea called education. I no longer pilot a boat, but I am now in the position to guide people who are. I hope people like you to find and navigate the strongest streams, to avoid the dangers of riptides, shrinking sea levels, storm clouds, and careless big ships of politicians and funders. And you say, funders? I thought that was a good thing. But funders can give you money to do what they want the agenda to be and not what is best for the students or the people. So I know that my time is running out. So there's a couple of things I want to leave you with, a few things I want to shine a light on for you as the lighthouse. Create lessons that stimulate curiosity. Let the students, let it be student driven rather than adult driven. And as interesting and talented as you might be, don't make it about you. It's hard to do, by the way. <laughs> and continue to practice your art form. Base lessons on the new standards. Know the concept of backward mapping. Backward mapping is where you start at the end of the lesson and you back up and you only include anything that's going to prepare the students to be able to accomplish and create something on their own. And really have a good partnership with the teacher. That's really, really important. Ask the students what they already know. Don't assume that they don't know anything. And they might surprise you by having things that they know that you didn't know. And finally, in terms of personal responsibility, be well-groomed, punctual. Have the ability to quickly assess the situation and calmly deal with it. And that's a challenge, believe me. The work's exciting. And one thing I want to make a point of is that you, in classes now, you might have a class of students that have a wide variety of abilities, come from a variety of backgrounds. And you might also have a lot of people, or a few people, who have special needs. And the, sometimes they have classes just for them to work on their skills. But often, through the arts activities in particular, they will be integrated into other classes. You need to know this. You need to know that they're as capable as anyone else. They may have some limitations physically or even emotionally and mentally, but they are human beings at the base of it all. And their spirit is as bright as all the other spirits. Just recently at the Music Center, the Royal Ballet was there. And they did a wonderful program for 12 uh, students who were teenagers and young adults who had special needs. The needs varied considerably. And they had three dancers from the Royal Ballet. And I went to a rehearsal, and it was one of the most magnificent things I've ever seen, because it was a normal situation. They were treating them like normal people coming in to learn about dance. They were expecting them and offering them the opportunity to find and tap into that expression through motion. They treated them with respect. They treated them like dancer. They choreographed a piece. They worked on it for four hours a day for five days and performed it in the Grand Hall of the Music Center. And I know, Mark, at the Wallace, we have you have the autistic program, Dance and Autism. So don't expect less of your students as my mentor Bella always said, treat all people 
as if they had great potential. Just with some, you start a little earlier or you start in a more simple form, but you all have the idea that they will be successful. So in conclusion, I have three questions and a challenge for you. Does this work interest you? You have to kind of have a calling a little bit for it. You got to be willing to be an individual who tackles a difficult part of life, and that is the raising of our children. And then, do you have the initiative of a pioneering spirit? Do you have the courage? And if you do, I highly encourage you to consider applying for the Artists and Schools training that the Actors Fund is offering to you under the tremendous guidance of Kimberly Arne. This will give you the tools, because now there are tools. When I started, as I said, there weren't. There are now. There's a lot of good artists as models out there. So seriously consider it, but only if you're really willing to put your heart and a little work into it but you'll grow tremendously. So I want to end with one quote by a man named Isaac Goldberg. There is that smaller world, which is the stage, and that larger stage, which is the world. So join in the play. It could be very fulfilling. Bye-bye. Hi. Uh, th thanks again. Yeah, let, let's give her another hand, please. My boss, Keith McNutt, and I were on the same mindset because I wanted to come back and just mention when I was saying thank yous to say thank you to Sony Pictures because frankly we also would not be here without that grant, and uh, this is the. Um, this is the sixth grant we have received from them uh, to be able to do this program. So I just want to throw that out to you. They have been an incredible uh, funder for this particular program. So thank you, Sony. Uh, I. I'm just so entranced uh, right now, uh, which Susan always does to me when we just even have, go and have dinner or lunch or coffee. Uh, but thank you so much, Susan. You really kind of did a lot of work that I thought I had to do today. Um, uh, well, one thing I also want to mention, the reason we're sitting here in the symposium this morning originated, and I mentioned this earlier, from a visionary thinker by the name of Leonardo Bravo. I remember that breakfast meeting over in Larchmont very well, Leonardo. Uh, also, um, Leonardo was our first teaching artist intensive developer and facilitator in 2008, 2009, and 2016. As a matter of fact, we stopped doing it after 2009 because there was no work you know, uh, available, so it didn't make a lot of sense. And uh, he was the one that came to me and says, you know, I think things are starting to percolate a little bit, and I think we need to look at it. But the idea of a symposium of bringing people together made sense. Over the last decade, uh, Leonardo has been a collaborator and a friend, which has impacted our arts education programming and our, 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 our teaching artists, uh, I, I know there are people in this room right now who are very impacted by his work. He himself is a visual artist, a painter, and over the past three years has been director of education and public programs with the Palm Springs Art Museum. I can t really tell you that he has had, had a major uh, impact on so many in this field. Um, so please help me in welcoming Leonardo Bravo. You know, I um, I get so incredibly nervous. I think as I get older to speak in groups, but uh, I made some notes. I, I didn't bring any quotes with me, which I should have. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, yeah, one of the reasons why I'm incredibly nervous is that I am following somebody who is 
um, I consider an amazing mentor, an incredible peer and guide for my own work, and that is Susan Kemi Tracy, who I think deserves another round of applause. <laughs> And not so much because Susan taught me a whole bunch of amazing strategies and ways of thinking about the work, but really because to me she represents a soul essence um, about this work. And the soul essence that I think she brings forth to it really has to do with notions of empathy and gratitude. Um, because to really do this work uh, means to enter into a space um, of understanding and compassion and empathy about the group of folks that are right in front of you. Um, and a gratitude for this work because even though it is incredibly complex and challenging, it forces you to be present, uh, to be present in the moment and to have this notion of there are larger forces in the world that pull you towards this work um, and that as you are present in this work, um, the rewards are ever amplifying. Um, so those are things that I think as I get a little bit older, I, I think more and more about these notions and of, you know, what it means to be in a classroom with students or to be in a group with uh, teachers. Um, and I think so much about the kind of mentors that I've had, including Susan, um, including Carolyn G at the Galef Institute including Mark Slavkin, um, as I think much more about the bigger picture of this kind of work, and my colleague Josephine Ramirez, um, now who she's back at the Music Center. And a lot of it has to do with these ideas of um, how to foster stability and resilience, which is what Joanne mentioned um, in the work that the Actors Fund does. Because I ultimately think that the work is not just about what happens in the classroom in an isolated moment, but really it's about the conditions that happen in those neighborhoods, in those communities, in our city, and those conditions that are being reflected in that classroom day in, day out. Um, I think a lot about um, you know, moments in which I started this work, uh, particularly I did as well uh, national-based work with an entity called the Galef Institute, uh, which took me to many different places, including Arizona and Texas, Salt Lake City and Kentucky, um, where I worked as a coach, as an artist coach which meant that I was, uh, I'd always meant to model the work in the classroom, but also work with classroom teachers of how to embed um, on arts integration strategies into their practice. And I think the first summer was actually where I went to Detroit for three or four weeks, uh, Detroit Rock City, which was an incredible place to be in the early 2000s. Um, and the notion of me as a sort of young, somewhat green and naive artist who felt like, yes, I can bring my joy and passion to this work and that will easily translate and people will obviously see the benefit of this, this in, their, in their practice. And the reality is that we were there to do these intensive uh, professional development training sessions with with uh, teachers in, in the Detroit public uh, school system. And my first day, uh, the teachers basically ignored me. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was there sort of, I think, with the best intentions. And um, I almost broke down. And uh, Carolyn G., my mentor at the time, came to me and said, look, it's, it's there. It's all there. It's in your center. Just find it. You know, it's, 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 it's all there. Um, and I think that's when the work as hard as that summer was, um, became alive because it really meant about who we are as humans and what it means to create a space uh, for dialogue, for understanding, what it means to sort of set aside all your assumptions um, about what you're bringing and to truly listen to who people are and to kind of embody and enter into that space of empathy and understanding and gratitude for just really being there. Um, you know, I learned so much from those teachers in Detroit. Um, I learned about dignity <laughs> and integrity <clears throat> and resilience 
Um, and then a lot of this, I think, has really pushed my thinking forward, and I'm so happy Jonathan is here, because I think so much about what is the social effectiveness of art and culture uh, when we think about equitable collaborations in community, and communities being represented by schools as a un unit of change, and what it really means to be in a spirit of shared design and authorship, that we're not just the experts, that the expertship and the knowledge is there in those communities and those neighborhoods. And the fact is that many of those neighborhoods, there might be not a lack of arts and culture, but there is a wealth of creativity. And that's the kind of thinking that we need to embody and think about. I'm just looking at my timer. Um, as, as we do that, this work, um, that is really about being in that space of listening and kind of opening up time and space to reflect on what the contribution and the shared design and the shared authorship of a project can be. Um, a lot of times I think so much about not only what is a project, but who is the project for? Um, how do we begin coordinating these projects and these activities um, within communities? Um, and what is the impact of the project? You know, how do we, this notion of um, backwards planning, um, what is the kind of impact that we want to have? How do we sort of represent that, that true wealth, that creative wealth that is in communities? And when we are artists, how do we think really about the arts? Um, is it about you know, the heightened sort of space um, or expression of, a, of an artistic form? Or can it be about rituals and cultural moments that bring us together? You know, this notion of dance as a ritual in which we are able to express something about ourselves being human. And uh, as I do more and more of this work, I really believe that it is about storytelling. Um, because I, I think the, the arts truly best represent how we share who we are as human beings and how we sort of convey that, that human story. Um, I think that is, that is the piece that, that truly sort of um, gets to me now. And I can cite an example of a project that I did in Palm Springs uh, when I brought a, uh, a textile artist weaver from Oaxaca, his name is Porfirio Gutierrez, uh, who works both out of Oxnard in Ventura and Oaxaca. And uh, Porfirio is a master of his craft, um, but he comes from a small village in Oaxaca where this, the practice of, of weaving has happened for thousands of years. And what's amazing about uh, Porfirio is that he also believes in a very sustainable approach to the craft because they source the colors uh, for the textiles directly from the land. Um, so Porfirio carries not only an ability to express and talk about his artistic expression at such a highly refined and technical way, um, but he's also been able to, create, to connect it to a lineage, uh, to cultural traditions that are passed down generation after generation after generation. And those kind of stories are being passed down here in Southern California. And the way in which these migratory patterns and immigrants come here uh, to this land and enrich it um, with their own traditions, which at times become embedded into ours. Um, so it was beautifully empowering to see the work of Porfirio as he brought his own loom to the museum. And we were able to not only connect to the community of Palm Springs itself, but to the larger community of the Coachella Valley, which includes immigrant uh, indigenous communities from southern Mexico that have historically migrated there as well. Um, through, so through time and space, <laughs> we were able to create these incredible leaps and sort of alignments um, of who we are as human beings. And I think that really that's what drives the work for me now is this notion of what is it that we can bring to the work? Um, how is it that we can sit in a room with people, that we can begin to listen to our shared stories, our shared humanity, um, and be able to sort of contribute uh, who we are a little bit to that, to that mix. Um, I think, you know, I want to thank also Joanne Webb and Keith McNutt for really giving me the opportunity a few years ago to start putting the seeds around this teaching artist training, 
which was really, um, at the time, I approached it from this notion that we all have an incredible amount of artistic capabilities, um, creative talent, but how do we create uh, what Susan talked about, this notion of this clear structure, this framework that really drives our work? And I think the beautiful thing of being a teaching artist is not only being present, but this notion of um, that we have to get to a place. We have to create a journey. And that journey is the storytelling or the sharing that happens in the classroom day to day through your lessons. Um, but the lessons are driven from something that is deep in here, in the soul. It is at times intuitive. But we do work with an incredible sense of framework that gives us that latitude to deliver on this work. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, it's not, you know, I encourage you guys to be part of this, to be part of the, the larger journey. Um, and, you know, I think this really just, it's a beautiful moment for me to reflect on what this work is all about. So thank you so much. <laughs> So how are we doing? Okay, okay you're getting, getting a little bit more information, formulating different ideas. Um, so um, uh, we're going to go into our panel next, but I want to introduce uh, our moderator, who is Mark Slavkin, who um, Mark, as you know, is um, the director of arts education here at the Wallace, which uh, he does they do extraordinary things. I'm hoping he's going to tell you a little bit about the space, too. Those of that you don't know that this used to be uh, the Beverly Hills um, post office at one time, <laughs> you know, if you can imagine. And, um, and here we are in it uh, talking about teaching artists. And uh, he is also um, uh, chairs the, uh, the board of um, directors for the California Alliance for Arts Education, the statewide pal policy and advocacy organization. And you know, one of the things I love about arts education too is the advocacy part of it. You know, that you're really advocating for um, for for truth. You know, and for for um, level trying to make a level field for people um, because it isn't very level. You know, the way it's set up. So um, that's very exciting stuff. So. I'm going, to I'm going to have Mark come up here, and Mark is going to introduce the panel, okay? By now you should know if you are one of the people participating in this panel, so I'd invite uh, you to come <laughs> forward, <laughs> Jonathan and Denise and Sheila, because um, right now, come on, come on up and grab a chair, and then I'll introduce you. Okay, um, so let me introduce my friends and colleagues who are here, and then I can say a little bit just about where we are, starting on the left. Denise Grande is the Director of Arts Education for the Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture. It is finally an official department, where for a long time it was not. Um, and she leads an effort to help elevate arts education among the 81 school districts in our county, plus some other stuff as well. But very happy that you're here. Jonathan Zeichner is executive director of a place called Home in South LA, a little bit east and south of USC, um, that does amazing work in the arts and beyond for kids and families living in that community that we'll talk about. And Sheila Scott Wilkinson is founder of Theater of Hearts um, and has worked as an artist and advocate for young people um, and working in schools and out of schools. So thank you all for, for being here. Um, what I'll just say about the Beverly Hills Post Office, uh, built in 1932 for $350,000. Um, is that some committee in Washington approved the design of this building and said, yes, let's go with the palatial marble Renaissance revival look, um, which today would be like a 60 minute story. It would be like a scandal, like look what they're doing, wasting your money on this building. But that was a time in the depression when Frank Delano Roosevelt was president that the belief was that public democratic spaces ought to elevate all of us and ought to be elegant and beautiful and inspiring. So I feel very fortunate uh, to work here. 
the room that we're in was the sorting room with the loading docks on the other side of that wall. They would bring in all the mail and there were table and these little cubbies and the mail people um, would sort all the letters by houses and blocks and so on. And this catwalk above existed for like the boss supervisor people to look down <laughs> and make sure everybody was like not putting anything maybe in their pocket or, or something. Um, but it's amazing to think like who is the mail to and from people in Beverly Hills since 1932 that have passed through this room. So I feel like it is sort of a sacred space in its own way. And we have converted it to the lovely studio theater, um, which we're sitting in today. So I'll stop with my, my Wallace story. Um, I want to engage with the conversation with my colleagues and with you. So as we go along, be thinking of questions that you want to pose, and I'll do my best to, to bring you into it. Um, in terms of microphones, we can share. So maybe Jonathan and Denise can share that one, and Sheila and I can share this one. Um, my first question is just in terms of your own personal journey and thinking about Susan and Leonardo and what they've shared. What were those key times or moments that have sort of shaped how you think about teaching artists, um, which could be a long time ago or could be yesterday or something in between? And many of you have worn, or all of you, different hats. But sort of what stands out that the way you think today about teaching artists is shaped so much because of what? Does that make sense? Each candidate has 30 seconds in this round. Um, you want to start? Sure. 30 seconds. Um, the, the, what really encouraged me in, initially, of course, you know, just like yourselves, I was an actor uh, for many years. And um, I really wanted to look at the art for social change. So I started to teach uh, young kids in the inner city. And what really, I saw what happened in the arts is the transformation, is that the youngsters really became youngsters again. There's so many issues that they have to deal with that when we were really expanding their horizon, the dialogue with the youngsters and seeing the sparkle in their faces, it really encouraged me to continue the voyage that I'm on right now. Oh. Uh, well, thank you. Um, it's great to be here. <clears throat> it's amazing to actually be sitting here with colleagues that I've been interacting with for probably three decades. And, uh, and I just have to say, uh, Susan, that that was the most replete and elegant description of what the arts are, why they're important in education, why arts education is important and and Leonardo a reminder for those of us gray beards and gray hairs now uh, of how um, the older we get the more essential is our understanding of why we're doing what we're doing but um, I will say that for me I go back to when I was in high school latchkey kid without much uh, parental guidance um, and I got turned on by a teacher who'd been in the Peace Corps and who started teaching theater in this hippie high school where I was. And the Vietnam War was still on. And we did uh, the play Indians and, and laid out the Indian Village Massacre exactly the way the Malay Massacre was and had slides of that on the walls. We did Lysistrata. And we had people in the audience standing up and yelling uh, on both sides of these arguments. And I felt this sudden understanding that the arts are a place where we can empower ourselves that is not dependent on money or violence, and that everybody has the capacity to do that. And that really has been the essence of uh, what drives me in, in sharing uh, and, and instructing and bringing artists into the inner city to work with um, kids who are facing a lot of adversity. So the short story is that um, growing up as a troubled teenager, as so many of us are or have been. Um, the arts, both writing and dance, gave me voice that I had no other way of expressing. And um, I really sort of, well, I continued to pursue dance 
and recognized early on that I am not a performer. I was never comfortable being in front of people. Um, and so how did I rec reconcile those two things? The way I reconciled those two things is I knew deeply that um, I was a choreographer. And so all of my emphasis went in using other bodies to communicate deeper mess messages that could only be, com could be communicated through community. Um, so I have never been a teaching artist, but have spent many decades now working with teaching artists as a choreographer or translator between the classroom teacher and the teaching artist community. Um, and now, um, over the past seven years, find myself in um, being a translator of the role of the arts, not only in schools, but in, in the many areas in communities and outside of schools. So let me just follow up where Denise was. We've talked a lot about arts education and what happens within K-12 schools, which is profoundly important, but not the beginning and end of all life as we <laughs> know it, although it can feel like its own universe. Um, but there are wonderful opportunities for teaching artists to work with young people outside of school, as well as with people who are incarcerated, people who are in probation camps, people who are in hospitals, people who are in jails, people who are in mental health facilities. We have a program here we do on Tuesday mornings called Dancing Through Parkinson's for older adults with Parkinson's disease. So there's that whole range. And um, in, in thinking about that, and maybe start with Denise where we left off, um, are those fundamentally different roles for teaching artists in school versus out of school? Is it like two sides of the same coin? How much are they the same and how much are they different? Because I'm thinking for somebody who's not currently working as a teaching artist, like how do I find myself in that world? Are those multiple worlds or is it like one big world all mushed together? I'm going to answer, but I'm also going to defer to the other two people on stage who actually have much more experience in being in the classrooms with these different populations. I can talk about it from the more systems and um, systems change um, efforts that are happening right now. And um, yes, they are very different. Um, and there are many ways that they're the same. So uh, things like... Um, Susan referenced, which ha of having it be the work be generated and responsive to the people in the room, and that you are the guide, or a teaching artist is the guide, the facilitator that's bringing forth other people's um, work. I think that's common. Um, I think the ability to manage time to achieve goals of um, so that the group feels like they're making progress and is making tangible progress. So things like pacing and um, constructing lessons, that's uh, similar across settings. But there are definitely specific needs and um, points of reference that each of those different kinds of communities bring that to specialize um, that if you are interested in going to any of into any of those arenas, um, know that there are um, special um, circumstances or contexts that you need to be a, aware of. Um, triggers for some populations that would not be triggers in other um, for other populations, and just know that they exist and uh, honor. I would encourage you to honor. Um, all of the work that has come before you and really lean on uh, um, those that have done the work for a long time. There's a lot of um, ex specific expertise to be gleaned from those who uh, walk in shoes before you. Yes, um, art in other places. Um, our organization, we provide arts wherever the need is. We go wherever the need is. And that can be in a juvenile hall, probation camp. Uh, it can be in a library. It can be in a residential home, working with kids who are uh, substance abuse. It can be working with anywhere there's a need. But the one thing I do want to say is it's all arts education. A lot of people think that arts in other places is like an enrichment. Uh, you know, it's a foo-foo, but it's not. Uh, it's very important 
that the work that is being done here and with you guys, uh, learning the, um, the standards, how to operate within a classroom, those are the things that you'll be able to carry no matter where you go. Now, wherever you go, there are different guidelines. There's different things that you have to uh, adhere to. And for instance, in terms of working in a juvenile hall probation camp, you are working with kids who are moving all of the time. You have to think about project-based learning. Project-based learning where uh, kids, you may get a kid for one or two days, maybe three days. So you have to go in really having a project that they're going to walk out with something that day, but you're planting a seed. You may catch that kid on the outside as well. Um, in terms of working in the libraries, a lot of times you're connecting with the books that they're reading in the libraries. A lot of times they're asking you uh, what, what we can bring to them in terms of which discipline. Is it visual arts? Is it theater? Whatever that is. Um, in the community, working with, we work with the gang reduction program. These are working with middle school kids. That means that we're doing a lot of work with counselors. And a lot of times, the counselors, they don't understand the arts at all. So there's training that has to be done with the counselors so that they can see what the arts actually is, uh, uh, how the arts really moves through the systems with the kids. And, and in terms of that, you have to really think in terms of uh, youth development. That's the piece that we're using, youth development, where it connects to the career choices of the kids. How does, it, how does that work in the uh, uh, skills in the life of a youngster? If they go for a job interview, how do they walk into a room? How do they speak? This is all connected. And that's the youth development part. So um, I'm going to turn it over to you right now. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, well, Sheila, a beautiful job of talking about the kind of technical and, and instructional and skills base. So I'm going to not repeat that and go into a little different uh, part of it. It's all connected. The, the arts are nourishment for the human spirit. And when you're in a psychiatric hospital or a prison or a homeless shelter, uh, and as Sheila says, you might be working with somebody for one hour and you may never see them again. Or you may see them again weeks or months or even years later if you're continuing to work in that sector. Um, the structure in some of these places or the lack of support or, or even respect uh, for what you're doing can be evident. So it's important to be grounded and understand what you're there for and understand that when you interact with another human being, and Leonardo talked about story, that you have an opportunity to give them something, to leave them with something that will fuel some flame that is already in them, by the way. Let's not think of this in a colonialistic way and in a narcissistic way. We are not there to save people. We are there to offer them tools and opportunities and perhaps a way of thinking about things and respect for who they are as human beings so that when they walk out, somehow you've, you've helped to light or fuel that flame. And when you're working with people who are mentally ill, you may not see it at all. But <clears throat> I did that for a long time, and I have a brother who's mentally ill, who's been on and off the streets for a long time. And you come to understand that whether it's for one hour, one day, one week, or a year, that what you're doing has value. Not for the faint of heart. That's the other thing to know. This is not a job. This is a calling. It's a lifestyle. <laughs> you know, it's a mission. I want to add two things to build on um, what's been said. Um, I find myself often quoting um, somebody who was the head of an organization called the Amityville Reentry Center, and it was about three years ago. I was at um, uh, Mark Ridley Thomas 
annual youth empowerment congress or empowerment congress and i was we were just starting to um touch into the juvenile justice space and so i went to a panel about um uh, community reentry. So essentially, middle-aged men who were in their 40s and 50s, who had been sentenced to life in prison in California in the 80s and 90s because of the uh, drug things, um, who were being released after 25 years. And so his organization was one of several on a panel that um, were talking about um, the, the real support that these young men needed in re-entering uh, society. And so I was just there to get smarter about this whole criminal justice reform uh, issue. And at the end, uh, he said, you know, we've been talking all about this, but uh, we can't underestimate the power of the arts in this work. Like, I immediately sat up, like, looking all around, no arts people in the room, and I'm like, oh, this is going to be good. Um, and he just quietly said, in order for the people that we're working with to make the kind of transformation we're hoping that they can make, they need to be in touch, they need to have hope. In order to have hope, they have to be in touch with their own sense of humanity. And what better way through, than through the arts to be put in touch with their own sense of humanity. And that's something that I continue to quote because it came from somebody who was not in the art space. And that's the bridge I wanna make here. Um, so much of your work, if you choose to do this, will be going into, into places and classrooms and hospitals where the person, the teacher, the practitioner that you might be coming into direct contact with will not have any reference point for like, why are you there and how are the arts gonna help? However, I'm also here to try to change the narrative. Americans for the Arts, year after year after year, does public polling about the importance and the value of the arts to parents and to uh, citizens across the country. And over and over and over again, it comes back as being important to 90% of households. Um, going back 17 years when um, the initiative I work in was launched, they su we su um, surveyed all superintendents in the 81 school districts. Did they think the arts were a priority? Were they important? Um, and now in talking to um, the head of probation in LA County, mental health and probation in LA County, um, children and family services, animal care and control, tax and, uh, tax, um, the tax collect, auditor controller and tax collector, like units of government are coming together saying, we recognize that the arts have a place in building a better society. Um, and we know this is important and it's time for us to move. So I draw the quote from the head of the reentry center as evidence that people know this, leaders know this. I draw the data from, I reference the data from national surveys because it is a commonly held to believe. And I lift up the conversations happening in county government right now. Because as you may be confronting that individual teacher or that individual clinician who like maybe doesn't get it, recognize that there is a bit of a renaissance happening right now and a movement that is shaping and changing um, our county right now. Um, I often think of it, um, you know, the, I don't even know whose quote it is, but in times of great um, turmoil, there's the opportunity for greatest change. And with what has been happening in our country in the last few years and what that has um, um, shaken up, um, I expect and believe that five years from now, um, our work in arts and communities will look very different than it has for the last 30 years. If someone is interested in being, becoming a teaching artist with all these opportunities, how do you know where you can make the best difference? How do you know if you're going to be more effective working with a kindergarten class or youth in a probation camp? or people in a healthcare setting, or middle schoolers. Is that trial by trial and error? You just figure it out? How, how do you go about even figuring that out? Or what advice would you give? Um, I think that really an organization, if you attach yourself to an organization, they will do a lot of the grunt work for you. In other words, they will uh, connect with the school and our, the uh, site that you'll be working with. They will be training you. They will also 
help in terms of that connection, uh, in terms of the curriculum development. They will uh, really be your guide and the person that you will be able to call when you need to be talked off of the ledge. Because I guarantee you that at some point, you're going to be wanting to say, I don't think this is for me. <laughs> but when you make, when you turn that corner, just as Susan has talked about, I mean, she said it so beautifully, uh, in terms of why we do this work. But to get to the nitty gritty of it, it is challenging. But it's very, very rewarding. So Mark asked, how do you uh, indeed, is it the grade level? Do you work in prison? Do you work with the juvenile hall? Do you work in community? From my observation in the years that I've been working with artists, artists really can do it all. It just means that you need the guidance many times to do it all. Some, some artists have come to me and said, I only want to work with high school kids, and that's it. And then we, OK, we give them that for a minute. <laughs> and then we turn them over to the little babies. And, then, and they say, oh, that was, they're so nice. They're so great. So you know, you have the capacity to do it all. There's, there's something that I always, as a as an artist myself, they always said, well, you know, you have to be a teacher. An artist doesn't know how to teach. Well, you have so many tools in your back pocket. Uh, as a professional artist, you know how to pull out those tools and work just about, in, if you are a working artist, this is what is so beautifully, and I think Susan alluded to that. You have a lot there. Uh, in terms of your grade levels, uh, you have to have, you know, of course, the uh, residency plan. We always ask for the residency plan. That's very important. And you can modify that for different age ranges. Whether you are going to work in a, a, a lockdown facility, we do a lot of training for that. Now, it's not that it's dangerous because it's not. It's just the rules and the regulations are so very strict. And now, you know, you have to take, uh, you know, you have to do the background check, the TB test. Uh, you have to do the uh, mandate child abuse uh, re reporter if you're going to work with any kids in the system. So there's a lot of, I'm giving you a little bit more information in terms of what you have to do to get in and on a, a roster of any of the organizations. It takes a minute to get on our roster, but uh, as I said, we do a lot of the work for you, but then it's up to you and to use your skills. All those things that Sheila said, and, and since they're so transferable and really you will have many options in front of you, I would encourage you to start with what you love and start with what you know you're called to, um, and resist the temptation, sometimes the economic temptation, to be all things to all people, particularly when you're first starting out. Um, be mindful of how thin you might be spreading yourself around areas that may be unfamiliar, and my recommendation would be to start building expertise in what it is you love and are called to. All excellent. So I'll add uh, maybe another little different slant to it, which is, um, uh, and I'll include my, myself in this, I think as artists, especially performers, those of us who have done that, uh, one of the things that you'll need to do is get past your narcissism and understand that... Um, this is service work. So if your expectation is that you're going to go in and, you know, the kids are going to be sitting there like this, you know, looking <laughs> up at you, or you're working with lifers in prison, or you're in a homeless shelter, or with veterans who've been struggling with drug addiction, your job, I remember once I was at a, a forum, and uh, Milos Forman was there, and, and 
somebody said to him, how do you get these Oscar-winning performances out of so many different kinds of actors? And, and he said, your job as a director is to figure out which hat to wear. And each person you meet needs you to meet them where they are. And so when you're working with a large classroom, that may sound glib to say something like that. But in fact, you start seeing the individuals, you start feeling their energy, you see how they respond to each thing that you say. So I agree with what Denise said. You will, in addition to having the skills to do it just about anywhere, and you'll be thrown in some, so-and-so can't make it today, you got to go. But you will also find your niche. You'll find that place and that population um, and, and the other thing I will say, I believe that artists are healing themselves all the time. There's a reason why we do what we do. And the art saved my life. There's no question about it. And my guess is that that's true of most people sitting in this audience. So uh, you will be drawn to that population that also serves your self-healing because that's also where your strength is the wound is where your power is i don't know if i'm getting too esoteric with any of this stuff but there's so many technical levels and nuances to all of this and then there is this essential human emotional part of why we're doing what we're doing if you can did you just share some of the resources that you have through the LA County Arts Education Collective for teaching artists or arts organizations, thinking about how can we navigate and connect to other school districts, what advice would you give her? What resources would you point them to? Right. I'll let you talk about the directory. This is unrehearsed and live yeah. as it happened. Um, Sheila, Sheila, why don't you start, though, because as an arts organization who hires teaching artists, can you talk about the directory as, it's, as you see it of value, and then I'll kind of uh, go to a higher level. Okay. A different, a, different um, a, a more systems, broad systems scale level. That's what I meant. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> well, uh, the county, the arts council, I mean, the arts uh, commission, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I, it's another new name. That's new name. I got to get used to the new name. But anyway, they have a directory of practically a, all of the arts organizations that have been vetted to do arts education, working with standard based arts education. So you can always look on that. You can see, you know, who, the, what the, um, the organization does, who do they, who, who, who are the, uh, the districts that they work with, whether it's school districts, schools, so forth and so on, and also all of their programs. So it does uh, tell you all of their programs. But I did want to just mention one thing on this. Um, it really is how you set up the program. Uh, in terms of working with the schools or working with anyone, it's really important that we have supportive people to work with. So when we go into any place, uh, whether it's a school, community center, uh, it doesn't matter. We want to find those supportive individuals that understand why we're there. And we have to do the work sometimes with them. Uh, but that makes it easier on you guys when you go in that you're not fighting against what <laughs> Jonathan was talking about, uh, a, a teacher that doesn't get it at all. Um, a lot of times you really, really want to make a collaborative effort of working with the teachers, and that is beautifully when, they, when, they, when you can work with them. And also, the thing of it is, is that the, what the teachers say, or the coordinators, or whoever you're working with, they say, we've learned so many skills to work with the kids. You are leaving us with so many skills. And that's where the art is so beautifully uh, that, that we can really share that with the total universe. Yes. <laughs> Stratosphere. Strat no sphere. There's nothing higher than that. <laughs> 
So from the systems level. Um, so Sheila was referencing our directory. Uh, the intention is that that is a resource for school principals and school districts to go and find arts organizations that have been vetted. It is, and that it is also a resource for arts organizations to see who else is doing what kind of work for potential partnership and for um, artists who are thinking about coming in the field or are in the field looking for where they might, what under organizations they might work under. Um, you can find that um, our, the work from the county that is focused in arts education is called the LA County Arts Education Collective. So the website is LA County Arts Ed Collective. Um, the initiative was renamed a few years ago uh, because of the intention that it is not our work, it's like not county government work, it's our work, it's all of our work. And if we're really gonna achieve the goal that every child engages in the arts all year, every year, then it's gonna take the collective efforts of many, many hundreds of stakeholders. So Art, LA County Arts Ed Collective. Um, and on our website, like we have a newsletter and we have an upper, a listserv where oftentimes job postings are posted. There's a little bit of a, um, uh, the listserv is kind of a forum for uh, teaching artists and the artist community, but there are other resources. And part of why I paused um, when Mark asked about like, what does the county offer? Um, is because we are right in this moment at a moment of transition. Um, the the, all of the grounding documents, the framework, blueprint, strategic plan, whatever you want to call it, that launched our initiative in 2002 were signed by the Board of Super, adopted, signed and adopted by the Board of Supervisors then, none of whom are still in office today. And last April, um, they first of all adopted a motion that's called the Declaration of Student Rights to Equity in Arts Learning, make an, a strong commitment to the ongoing support of arts education. And I always say they understand it as a child development issue, an economic development issue, and a community development issue. Um, after they adopted the Declaration of Student Rights to Equity in Arts Learning, which is on our website, um, they directed the now Department of Arts and Culture to embark on a plan, uh, as, uh, debark, debark, embark on the work to update that initial strategic plan that was adopted in 2002. And so we are in the pro mid process of doing that. We started community meetings in uh, May and June, and those will end later this month. Um, and we hope to have a new plan put forward for the board in November. Um, but the point I want to make about that is that uh, the initial plan and the initial framework we've been operating on was focused exclusively in K-12 in-school instruction. That was a decision that was made uh, with a goal of equity. Uh, the feeling was that if we were going to really offer, ensure that all young people had the arts as part of their growing up, it needed to be during school um, as part of public education. Today we know that we've made great progress and we need to continue to push for that and not kind of let off the gas. We're too close, I think, to getting to the goals that we've all been working so hard to achieve. But the new plan will actually have four sections. It will absolutely stay focused, have a section focused on K-12 in-school instruction. The second section will focus specifically on pathways to the creative economy, so building creative career pathways for youth. And you all have a lot to contribute in terms of um, pathways to jobs in the creative economy. The third section um, is not creating something new, it's just kind of opening up the tent and acknowledging that arts education in communities, community-based arts instruction has been happening for decades and we're now bringing that part of the work into the fold as it helps support all young people having year-long opportunities. And then the final section, which is the, the newest evolution of the work, is that the Board of Supervisors have um, asked us to think deeply about how the arts might be embedded into all county departments and services 
to support youth and families. And so we've been meeting with animal care and control and uh, auditor, tech, auditor controller and children and family services and all of the other departments you can think of um, to think about and put forward a plan that embeds the arts and county services. Um, yeah, I'll stop. I'll, I'm gonna, I, by, before this is over, I'm gonna like call to action this, but not right now. Uh, just to add, um, well, first of all, sorry I took it a little dark there earlier. I'm, I'm not bitter, uh, but, 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 but I am frustrated by systems that make it difficult for us to do the work that we need to do. Uh, but that is a reason to do it. That is a reason to go into LAUSD. And as a teaching artist, uh, I highly uh, encourage you to do that. As an administrator, I'm happy not to be uh, working with LAUSD anymore. But I did want to take a moment to let you know that an organization like A Place Called Home is also a place where you can go to work not as a freelancer, although we do bring in about two to three dozen independent contractors through our arts programs uh, on a regular basis. But we also have, um, uh, you know, a commitment to the arts with departments in fine art, music, dance, digital media, and theater. And we have full-time artists who work in those departments. So it's a limited number of positions, but these are folks who get to work year-round, uh, get benefits, um, you know, and have fixed facilities. We have a community center that has a theater and a recording studio and a dance studio and an art studio, et cetera, et cetera. So those things do exist as well. Absolutely. I'd mention Inner City Arts is another organization that has staff that's full time. Questions that anyone wants to raise that we can try to address? Yes. Um, most of the artists that we work with, they're contract artists, they're paid contract artists, and uh, they parallel their careers working with our organization. So it's not a full-time situation, but some of our artists are doing two and three contracts with us because they have the time. But when they go out on tour, when they go and do a play, when whatever, they're all professional then they're off and they may come back, they come back. But uh, we do pay, we feel we pay pretty good uh, for uh, the time. They're contracted for a certain amount of time, usually it's 13 to 15 weeks, uh, uh, two or four, four hours a day. So that's the story there. You know, and, and most of us who've worked as teaching artists over the years have worked as independent contractors and freelancers, and uh, uh, the state challenges that in various bureaucratic ways. But it, it, one of the trade-offs, of course, if you're going to work full-time at an organization like a place called home, is it makes it harder for you to, you know, take a touring show or, uh, you know, go out for auditions in the middle of the day. So there are trade-offs. There are decisions that you have to make. And um, and I think some of it comes down again to why you're doing what you're doing. Why are you an artist? Uh, and for some of us, I remember for, for for when I first moved to LA as a struggling actor and was doing you know theater and going out on auditions and stuff. At a certain point, I was like, you know. The work that I'm getting to do uh, professionally that I'm getting paid for um, in television or in film, uh, I, you know, I wasn't a big star. I was doing little roles, and a lot of it was not that meaningful. You know, I didn't think it was very high quality material. And so at a certain point, uh, I made a decision, which was I would rather invest in working on and living in and, and, and teaching and sharing the arts as a vehicle for social justice and human development uh, than try to get famous, you know, because that was no longer fulfilling for me. So I think that you get to a certain point in your career where you start thinking about what's the meaning of what you're doing. And there are great opportunities and there are great artists whose names are not in lights but who are doing the work at Sheila's organization and many other organizations. Yep. I would just add that oftentimes a teaching artist will have a relationship with several different agencies. 
um, and, and so no one is full time, but between three or four, that could be much more sustainable. Yeah. Oh, cool. She has my microphone. <laughs> Theater. Um, how, it is on. Oh, it's on now. Okay, great. My name is Sean, and I really love the program. I love what you guys are talking about. Is there a specific level of education? Do you need a certain degree in something to be a teacher, teacher's artist? Great question. For us, we follow the California Arts Council guidelines. That means that you have to be in your chosen profession for at least five to six years and uh, as a professional artist. So I know that some artists, I mean, it doesn't necessarily, like musicians, they may have mentors in, in uh, dancers or whatever, they may have uh, mentors, so they don't have a degree necessarily, but they are fantastic artists and they have a, uh, uh, a resume that can prove that that's what they do. Okay, a couple more questions. Women there. I would say if you have a long track record and you can immediately demonstrate your understanding of curriculum design, your connection and ability to collaborate with cl classroom teachers, um, there are many schools that will hire uh, independent and do hire independent artists. Um, the, the, the choice you will be making is um, oftentimes organizations run their payroll on a very different kind of ongoing cycle. So your payment may be more consistent and timely if the organization you're working with is um, carrying the, uh, what's it called, money flow? That's not the right word. Um, school districts, uh, you know, there's a lot of, bro there's a lot of bro bureaucracy, often can't, often can't bill until all services are rendered. So it's the cash flow a piece. Um, so it's that, that level of administrative that, um, work that, and support that an organization can give you. And as Mark said, many, ar many artists do both. I would also add that it can be very lonely just being by yourself. Um, it can be, so there's a sense of community that can come with being part of an organization that brings artists together that has its own kind of rewards, not literally financial, than just being in your car and battling the world by yourself. Did you want to add something? I did, but I forgot what it was. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And um, what I've witnessed is we've done a lot of video projects that have brought a population more into the public eye, and it's a population that, that's not always comfortable with being in front of people, and it's really um, given them a lot of confidence. So with your programs, you've talked a lot about like the K through 12 and the younger. Do your organizations also have something for the aging population? We did. Um, we had three years, we were funded for three years uh, to work with senior citizens. And it was very successful. It was a photography program. And uh, we were at, f I think, five sites. And it went beautifully. However, after that, we were not able to get funded for it. They Somehow, that's not on the top of the list in terms of uh, funding for uh, senior citizens or there's a lot of programming now for that but the money's not there yet uh, uh, spent some time with the director of programming over at Inner City Arts the other day, and they did do something on elders, uh, at, you know, last year. It was all visual art type things. 
And uh, there are there is some stuff that's starting to click a little bit with intergenerational work, where you're bringing uh, young people together with elders. And I think that's and the Eisner uh, grant is one of them. Yeah, but I, I she was we were both talking about that. There's a real interest in that because right now. Um, there are 17% more people that are 65 and over than there are children from uh, infant to seven years old. So uh, because people are not having as many children, you know, on one side and the other side, people are living longer. So it's just something to be aware of. So this area of working with seniors is really, really, really important. Absolutely. Um, just put in a plug for the National Guild for Community Arts Education, based in New York, has a strand now around creative aging and is awarding grants, not huge grants, but funding, really underscoring the importance of that. So the National Guild for Community Arts Education. Unfortunately, the time for this panel is uh, completed, but I just want to thank Denise and Jonathan and Sheila for being with us this morning, sharing their passion and their expertise. Thank um, you. My pleasure. Well, thank you. Okay. How are we doing? Get, getting a little bit more information? Because the idea of a symposium is to really kind of do a deep dive and really get some ideas. And I'm sure you have lots of questions and a lot of things going on in your mind. So the next step we're going to be doing here is... Um, we, we, I couldn't bring all of my teaching artists here who are, are graduates, but we, one way we could do it, we, we prepared a video, so, which we're going to show you. Um, I want to, because he's here, I want to thank Scott Pfeiffer, who helped us put this together. Um, and he's also videotaping this so we can have this on, on Facebook, you know, so um, to, to help you if you wanted to re-listen re to something. So uh, we, put, we brought our teaching, some of our teaching artists graduates, this isn't all of them, but we thought it would be helpful for you to hear from them what their experience has been being a teaching artist. So, uh, and also Ashley, are you here? Where are you? Okay, you're here. Okay, I'll grab you as soon as after. So, go ahead. As an artist, I believe one of your tenements, fundamental, is this exchange. A part of that exchange for me is being a teacher, an educator. You use your art to educate. Um, and it was really instrumental for me when I found the Actors Fund. Once accepted, I uh, pursued the work as an artist, educator, and really understanding what I've been doing all along, but uh, making it concrete, sort of very specific in how I approach the work. And that's really important to have the ability to know how to present artistic ideas and sentiments uh, to people that are not artists, but do want to use the arts in a way to educate, to inspire, to build bridges. It's been a great balance. It's been a great um, chance for me to continue to expand my community. This is exactly where I needed to be and where I fit. So I applied for the Teaching Artist Intensive Program, and I was accepted, and I loved it and I felt like I really did find my people there. And it's so um, difficult in life to find where you absolutely fit, and I felt like I absolutely fit. So some of the things I learned there were classroom management skills, which I really needed. And I use, that, I use those skills in um, my teaching act, acting, that I do with the Children's Theater Company. And I, you know, it's invaluable information. One of the things I learned in the Teaching Artist Program was about arts integration. And I find that probably to be the most exciting aspect of it. And I have been uh, independently just kind of 
trying to fine tune and create different kinds of programs that make history more exciting, English more exciting, science more exciting, and um, do that according to VAPA standards, Common Core, and finding that happy medium. And so I'm hoping in the future that I'll be able to do some education consulting. Uh, I'm finding that a lot of principals and teachers are very interested in making their classroom uh, more multimedia friendly. And um, I think the benefit that I have is that I come from an artistic background because I, I really believe in STEAM. Um, a lot of times companies or schools are always STEM oriented. And of course, when we say STEAM, we're putting the arts into that particular um, abbreviation. So, you know, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, and all of it works together and drives each other. By being able to share what I do and what I know um, and my experience with, um, with kids or with anybody who isn't maybe, uh, uh, who hasn't had any kind of training or, or in underserved communities, especially who don't always who aren't always exposed to the arts uh, I've been able to see how uh, how my craft can really um, affect uh, somebody else's life even in um, developing professional skills for example um, giving them the confidence and communication skills to go out into the world to talk to people you know even in job interviews um, but even aside from that, just to, to see a, a spark of creativity from someone when they actually uh, connect and are able to experience emotion in a, script it, in a script or to create a character by just putting on glasses and a hat and all of a sudden having something come out of them that they never knew that they had is so rewarding. The Teaching Artist Program really looks at ways of infusing the arts into different subjects. So we were introduced to different Common Core standards and how we could integrate our special skills into that, whether it be dance, whether it be visual arts, whether it be singing. There's many different creative ways to combine the art form and then to put it into the schools. Um, I found in volunteering with my daughter's school that the biggest hurdle for the arts was time. The bell to bell is four or five hours and the teachers have to be concerned about teaching language arts or science or math and that's really important. But for the whole rounded child, I believe the arts is just as important. I gained so much confidence in my skills and my ability to, to be an arts educator in any classroom, any grade. And one of the ways that that confidence was instilled was there's a section in the curriculum, if you will, where we are working with VAPA standards, visual arts, visual arts, visual and performing arts standards. That's you know, mandated from the state. And I've applied for various teaching artist positions, dance teaching artist positions, because that's my thing. And they would ask, what's your experience with VAPA standards? Or do you have experience in being able to say yes, and not just, yeah, but to say yes, and to know how to put together a lesson plan that incorporates that. Uh, I've received jobs because of it. I actually have and a face-to-face -face interview in a couple weeks. And I had my phone interview three days ago and they asked me, do you have experience with VAPA standards? And I said, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Actors Fund. So I hope that was helpful. It was just give you an idea of some of the people. We feel like we've, we've had the opportunity to educate so many of our, our people. And I, you know we only had a window of time to be able to do this. I had quite a few other people I could have brought in. And we're going to continue doing that so you guys can get a little bit more education about uh, the people that are doing work. And I have on the screen uh, as well some of the organizations our teaching artists uh, are, are working with. Uh, and that's just some of them.